Hi, this is uh, author A.R. Shaw with Apocalypse Queen Radio. This is a copyrighted podcast solely owned by Authors on the Air. And today I have author Anthony J. I'm going to brutally massacre your name. Melchiori. Can you say it for me, please? No, no problem. Melchiori. 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 And yeah, one of those uh, Italian names. Apologize. <laughs> thank you. And um, I just finished his book and it is incredibly uh, impressive. I don't usually read zombie books, but I asked a buddy of mine, Stephen Conkley. I said, so I, you know, started this thing and I need, I need a zombie writer. Who do you recommend? And he said, he said you. And uh, not only not, and we had not met before. And after talking with you and uh, scheduling you and you graciously agreed to come on the show, then, um, Let's see, who else? Nicholas Sansbury Smith, you guys are buddies and I've known him for yeah. years. And so that's where it came around. Uh, read your book, The Tide, and or the first book in your Tide series and incredibly impressive because your your day job, your your background is so impressive. And um, I will have people chiming in here soon. I already see Kevin Pierce, who's uh, my audio guy. And I don't know if, uh, if, you've, if you've heard of him before, but he's pretty awesome. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I have to I have to read your bio or part of it now because it just blew me away, of course. So uh, you're a scientist with a Ph.D. in bioengineering. You're originally from the Midwest, but you now live in Texas, which is kind of funny because I now live in the Midwest and I'm from Texas. So <laughs> we just did the opposite thing. Uh, by day, he develops cellular therapies and 3D printable artificial organs. By night, he writes apocalyptic medical and science fiction thrillers that blend real world research with other worldly possibilities. When he isn't in the lab or at the keyboard, he spends his time running, reading, hiking, and traveling in search of new story ideas. That's incredible. <laughs> um, so tell us about your series, The Tide, The Tide series. What can yeah. you say? Oh, How many books yes. are in the series now? Part of you. Right now, there's there's the eighth book actually just came out on Sunday, um, okay. and there's planned uh, ten books to finish up the main storyline. Um, so that's where that series is at. I've got the ninth book in the pipeline for that, and the tide kind of came out of uh, as you mentioned. I'm good friends with uh, Nick Sansbury Smith, who uh, is. Um, yeah, yeah, I write the Extinction Cycle and Helldiver series, which have been his big apocalyptic mm -hmm. uh, bestsellers. Yeah. Um, and so I was talking a while back with him because I I like the zombie genre. I like the apocalyptic genre and, you know, read a lot of those stalwarts, like pretty much everybody followed The Walking Dead, read the comic books, all that kind of stuff. And so I had had um, some all right uh, reception from some medical thrillers but never really anything that, you know, drew a big audience. And uh, we were talking and brainstorming and he, he thought, you know, well, the zombie genre is a lot of fun to write in something that, you know, you should, you should consider because, you know, you've got the science background and I helped him with his science for extinction cycle. And then I found I had a ton of fun inventing, um, you know, new pathogens and biological weapons and stuff like that uh, using some, <laughs> some of the research, you know, that we do digging through medical papers, uh, adding a bit of fiction to it. And so that's really where, you know, the series sprung out of was, you know, what, what if we did this with, you know, the, the zombies instead of the, the, your typical zombie type monsters, what if I added this a tribute to them? How would that happen, you know, biologically? What kind of, you know, scientific phenomena are responsible for these kind of developments? And so I dug into that and then, uh, you know, picked my, picked my main characters, which I've always really liked Clive Cussler, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the, you know, sea adventures. And so I thought, hey, let's blend these, you know, some science, some sea adventures with these guys who have, you know, their own covert op ship and just thought it would be a ton of fun to write. <laughs> so, so yeah, they're great, they're like they're yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kevin, feel free to ask questions, please. Uh, let's see. So you do. You, so you draw from your own experiences, obviously, as a bioengineer. Is is the zombie creation phenomena? Could it really happen? <laughs> I I would like to emphatically say uh, no. I don't I don't think with the current state of science, I don't think in the near future that we would ever get to a standpoint where you're like uh, 
George Romero type or Walking Dead type zombies are a thing. Yeah. I think there are some things you could pull from and like the, you know, uh, the um, animal kingdom where you've got weird funguses that take over, you know, lesser organisms with less complicated nervous systems, like weird funguses that make, you know, ants into virtual zombies. Uh, but, yeah. but I think like turning people into like literally the walking dead, we have nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. Um, at least within the next, you know, 50, 60 years. I don't know what people are going to do in the future, but <laughs> but yeah. I would like to say that, yeah, like like everything, fortunately, a lot of these, you know, these zombie fied viruses are are really fictionalized. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say the threat of, you know, like a like a like an epidemic or something isn't real by any means, but at least zombie type stuff is. Right. I think we've all seen the crazy, uh, and it's it's sad, really, but there, there have been times where you'll see these uh, videos of people who are just on some kind of crazy drug, yeah. and it appears like they're really zombied out. But I mean, it, it's it's a it's a very sad situation. Yeah. For, fortunately, that's not spreadable. I have a friend uh, who uh, works in a pretty large uh, metropolitan police department, and yeah, with a lot of, like, PCP and stuff, unfortunately. Yeah. That that looks like zombies, but we have no risk of that spreading other than, you know, drug addiction. Contagious. Well, yeah, 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 that's its whole other topic. Not viral, yeah, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you relate to any of your characters? Um, uh, your your main protagonist, his name is Dom. He's, are you military by any chance? Or, because a lot of the, what you discussed in a lot of these, I'm thought, this guy's got a lot of background knowledge, or is this just from great video games, or do you have great uh, resources for these things? Yeah, I'm, I, I myself am not military. Um, I uh, have a brother who's in the Air Force, an uncle who served in the Air National Guard uh, for a few decades, and then my grandfather was, you know, like uh, many uh, people in, of his generation drafted in World War II, so... I have, I at least had a lot of sources that I could draw from for those things. So mm -hmm. like, if you do follow along with the series, you'll see I get some things wrong and that's totally on me because I try to do my best research and everything. But since I'm not myself, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like in military, I unfortunately right. get Even some things wrong. But I, I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm former Air Force. I was a radio operator in the Air Force. That technology 20 years ago is totally different now. So, I mean, I yeah, get- I can, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> It's completely different. So it's uh, it, it's it's also just a sign of the times and who you just who you talk to with and yeah you know it's it it's hard to keep up with everything, especially technology. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, even with the science stuff, like it's impossible for me to get all that correct all the time, even yeah. though that's you know, what I do <laughs> every like, day. Because that changes. I mean, it, it's a daily. There's new discoveries or new connections, mm -hmm. so those things do change. Um, let's see. So I, I was reading and, and I was thinking, um, one of the, I'm not going to give everything away, obviously, but there was a couple of things in here. So like, what do kidney stones and zombies have in common? Or, or <laughs> shall I say like, so I did not realize that kidney stones had a questionable bacteria, live bacteria thing with them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I never thought about that, but that is a question in science, like, apparently. Yeah, it's and I think that the question has mostly been answered. It was uh, I, can't, I can't remember these papers that I drew that from, um, but they're uh, about a decade and a half old or something. But I was digging through the papers, and so for people who aren't familiar with the tide, a major component of it is these zombies-like creatures aren't just zombies, but they have these growths in them, these bony growths that start, you know, like basically their their skeletons start growing out of their skin, uncontrolled rapid growth. Like and so, yeah, and so what you're talking about, like the, these nanobacteria um, are these, were supposedly these theoretical living organisms that were tinier than uh, originally predicted uh, based on just the size of DNA. Like sci scientists mostly pr say that you can't fit DNA into something that's that small. So uh, that, that thing probably doesn't actually exist, even though there were some papers that said, hey, you know, nanobacteria is the, this living organism that uh, kind of creates these calcified formations and stuff and might be, you know, might be found on everything from meteors to those, you know, vents that you see at the bottom of the ocean with, with uh, the thermal vents, things like that, living in all these crazy environments. Mm -hmm. And so somebody actually suggested that these tiny little nanobacteria might be responsible for 
the formation of kidney stones because they were associated with these calcification and uh, phenomena. <laughs> so yeah, it's a really weird connection. It's cool how you're doing research, like a lot of us will do research and we run, a, we run into something that's just totally crazy or, you know, it's, it's like, really? And then, then you, you kind of fit it in as best you can. And one of the things I noticed, and it, this is great for you, is like uh, uh, most of us have to research things like there's a virus in my in my first series as well. <clears throat> you research all of it and you're so great that you've made all these discoveries. And then we tend to info dump stuff into our novels and our readers are like, what is all of that? You already know a lot of the stuff or you research it, um, but you did not do that. You you carefully sprinkled it in and made it easy to understand. So I that was that was really cool. That was one of the great things I noticed about your writing because uh, you are a scientist in your day job and and that was um, you did that um, very well. So that was cool. But it also has something to do with coral reefs as well, which I thought was also an interesting pull. Like you um, you have these zombies and they do eventually develop like an exo exoskeleton, but then the growths have something to do with coral reefs. Is there some correlation with that? Is it, or is it kind of the same thing as the, uh, the kidney stone connection? Yeah, um, I would say, so like one thing that I try to do, like you're saying, is I really like writing about scientists as characters, because I think a lot of people who write about scientists, just like when I'm trying to write about the military, I can't get it right all the time, but I can get scientists mostly right. <laughs> so I try to write uh, them and try to get them in realistic scenarios, even in unrealistic uh, environments. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I what I try to do too though is, is instead of, like you said, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you didn't think I dropped any info dumps because I try to like You're weave that in through the perspective of these characters who are, you know, technically adept. And so part of that though, if I just go on about the actual science, it's all this, you know, jargon and nonsense that people, you know, like uh, even in my field wouldn't understand based mm -hmm. off these, you know, really esoteric papers. So what I tried to do is like with the coral reef thing is weave in these uh, analogies and stuff th that the scientists characters are using to explain how this phenomena works a little bit. And I mean, it's not, you know, anything, a crazy technique, but that's where the coral reef uh, comparison comes in. So, mm -hmm. so it, like a coral reef, isn't just a, a rock, a non-living rock, but it's a, you know, there's all these tiny little polyps that live inside that, and then they create these calcified rock formations around themselves to protect themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. So you effectively can think of like a coral reef as, you know, this, this entire uh, civilization of little, little creatures that are creating this massive structure. In the same way, like in the tide, that's what's going on with the zombies is you have these little bitty nanobacteria creating this big colony around, uh, around the, you know, the, the people and stuff creating those crazy... Um, Area. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's really cool. It was, and it's great that you kind of make those connections, and then your imagination just sort of takes off, and the story is better for it. That's really cool. I always like to point out passages or books that I've enjoyed, and um, I always sort of look like we we write dire stuff. I mean, <laughs> I've had to recently got a uh, a not so great review recently saying this is so depressing. <laughs> It's most apocalyptic, lady. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, sorry, but uh, you know, so sometimes there's humor. Sometimes we can weave yeah. in some humor, whether it's attitude or in in the worst of times, someone will crack a joke or just relieve the stress. Yeah. Um, I didn't find a ton of that in yours, but this is one thing I did <laughs> because you're like me. So uh, Jay's are uh, Jay's head pounded with all the fury of a feral cat caged for the first time. It's something relatable. Those of us that have cats, which I do, um, you, you, can, you can kind of understand that. It kind of puts you in the moment and it relieves a little stress at the same time. So <laughs> you're, you're very, um, your, your story was very engaging, but it was also very well written, especially for a science major. I mean, my son's a science major and he's the king of summary. I mean, that's what I was always told. So, um, so I, I found it, it just fantastic. Another really good, um, this I thought was very cool. You said, uh, so one of your strong female characters, and she just happens to be a teenager, Kara, 
um, she was trying to board, she was trying to block a doorway with everything she had and um, wonderful char char uh, character building there. But at one point you said um, an ornamental jewelry box fell and, sp and spilled pearls, necklaces and a tangle of earrings, but Kara ignored the mess. I mean, that puts you right there. Of course, you know, at every dresser and every woman's bedroom is covered with stuff. You know, so that, that's a normal, natural thing that would happen. It's something that you took the time to realize in order to make it seem real, to put the reader right there. That was excellent writing, I yeah, thought. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so um, what, what is your day job? Where do you, I mean, typically, you know, roundabout, we don't want fans rushing you. So where do you kind of work from and what's your daily life like? Yeah, I'm uh, so I have a weird position at a university where um, I kind of work as a research scientist and lab director. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I do I work with a, um, or help manage a few different research projects, um, as well as uh, work with some science education stuff. So we have a lot of, you know, we even have high schoolers and groups come into these labs at the university and we teach them the basics of the science and research that we do there. Um, so we have a, you know, it's kind of an interesting position. It's a mix of stuff. Uh, and then our research primarily centers around, you know, like you read in the bio, uh, 3D printing of different materials. And so I think 3D printing is easier to describe now because it's becoming more common. So people are used to seeing, you know, like the little plastic toys or things that you can 3D print. Uh, but instead of, you know, instead of like a little plastic toy, we're working on creating materials that uh, will foster living tissue. So y you can imagine we can we can print this really like uh, the 3D printing realm and bio, the bio world is really immature. So there's a lot of work still being done. So sometimes people think we can just make a whole organ and you can throw that in somebody. And that's in TV. And that's not the case. That's not so, true. <laughs> what we do is. We print like these materials that are basically like jello. And inside that jello, there's all kinds of different proteins and cells, all the components of you know your living body uh, that we, in the right conditions, after we grow them for a while longer, will turn into like a, a, a living tissue more or less that will help support regrowth of an organ or like your skin or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that we, we work in that realm. Um, it covers a lot of different fields. It's, uh, that's a pretty gross simplification of, of all that stuff, yeah, but yeah. you know, hopefully that makes sense. It's like you're, you're living, uh, you're living your stories there, there. It's, it's pretty cool. So, I mean, I, I have like read about replacement skin for burn victims. Is that kind of yeah. somewhat like, okay, that's very cool. So then, yeah, yeah we, and, Dave, go, ahead, go oh, ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say like, as far as the burn victim stuff, I know there's, uh, there's a, there's a lot of companies that already have, you know, kind of those constructs that you know you, you might be thinking of where they have like some living tissues right. along with some artificial material to develop that they can implant when a patient doesn't have skin that you can transplant and yeah like you said yeah we have some people that are working on projects that are similar to that where you can if you've got a really weird shaped uh burn or something then you can create this uh you can create this with a 3d printer we can create a custom shape that can fit that person perfectly and that goes for bones and you know all other kinds of tissues that have all their interesting complex shapes mm -hmm. that aren't easy to manufacture in any other way. Right. Like, I mean, how in the world do you make a nose? You know, I mean, just, yeah. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine. So after you do this all day, then you go home and write. Yeah. I usually try to break that up because my mind's spinning, you know, after like a day of work. So I, I go, either hit the gym or go for a run so I can clear my mind, give myself some space between the day job and then hit the keyboard and yeah, start, start going till I get my words out. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have a daily goal every day. Of yeah. I try to, I try to write about 2000 words a day, which uh, translates to about a chapter or like, you know, uh, depending on the book I'm writing, uh, yeah. you know, the majority of a chapter or something like that a day. Yeah. We have a couple of viewers, but I don't see any questions yet. You guys, please ask any questions that come to mind while he's here. Um, let's see. So what would you do if you no longer wrote, wrote? Okay. You didn't write stories anymore and you didn't have your day job. So let's say the oh, apocalypse man. happened. What would you do for your day job? 
Oh, do I have to pick a job in the apocalypse or like uh, like yeah, a real let's do that. Let's pick a job <laughs> in the apocalypse. What would you do? Uh, you know, I think that I would have to, um, I feel like the, the I, I'm trying to think of something that I could be useful at, you know? So <laughs> that, that's hard because those are- That's my new best question. Yeah. And yeah. what would be your job in the apocalypse? I think I would uh, I would have to go and uh, go the medic route and offer some very basic medical care because that's about the best useful thing I can do besides basic labor if it was the apocalypse. <laughs> you can build like an artificial, what did you call it, a 3D printer and like print stuff? <laughs> Man, if we don't have electricity, the only way that's happening is yeah, that's if we have somebody that's on a stationary bike or something. So... Hey, that, there you that go. That might be a little intense. Yeah, I could be the bike rider. How about that? I'll, do, <laughs> I'll just power the 3D printer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great new question. I'm going to have to start using that. Yeah, it's a frightening one. Because then you, I mean, like, I like to think, you know, oh, you know, I, How would I everybody be tries to prepare for something like that. But then, you know. <laughs> I, can do. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that would be hard. Okay, so. Um, so you've been a pretty successful author. What is like the most useful or best thing you've purchased, you know, being an author? Um, besides my computer, of course. <laughs> yeah. Keep upgrading those computers. Yeah, yeah I think, I think uh, the, this, one of the best things that I've done um, or that I've spent my money on isn't necessarily like any single object because I would say, you know, there's a wealth of information out there, a wealth of podcasts and, and resources that you can draw on to get mm -hmm. really good information on how to be a writer professionally, as um, well as, you know, your craft. There's so mm -hmm. many books out there. Like I, it would, it would be unfair to select any one, but right. I would say one thing that I've really, that has really helped me is also stepping away from the keyboard. Um, so whether that's the two big things stand out to me, and one is my running shoes. Those those have been a worthy investment, not just because it keeps you know it keeps me physically fit. It gives me a break from riding, uh, mm -hmm. but when I get outside, uh, when I when I'm not thinking about work or even you know um, have to think about any other you know daily responsibilities, I get the chance to just mull over story ideas. And I've found like uh, when I'm stuck or when I when I'm writing something, I'm like this is really boring. Um, I find going for a run or something helps clear my head and give me the, the chance to think of something cool. So things will hit me when I'm running that, that have been great. And that then is the, a common thing I've noticed. Sorry. Yeah. I think that's a common thing with writers. I mean, I've interviewed several. I know Nick runs. Yeah. Many of us take, you know, for me, it's usually like after, after I'm done with my writing day, then I've got to, I've got to go do something, whatever it is, um, be it running or just working out or whatever. But you need that so that you can clear your mind for the day. It doesn't mean you're not thinking about things. Mm -hmm. It's not still running in your mind, but you need that break, sort of. I yeah, that's that seems to be common with a lot of us. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I think I think too, like doing something, like the running thing, kind of fits well with with if you can, you know, as a writer, it fits well with you because we're used to these long, you know. Uh, it doesn't always feel rewarding when you're writing because it's, it can take a lot of work and it's yeah. mentally draining. And then, so I think we're used to that. Like we have the mental endurance and, and, and that kind of like uh, discipline that we're like, we do, we do the writing every day. So let's go do something physical every day. Right. It's, yeah. No. Great and it, it, I feel like a slug if I don't do something, then I'm like, I didn't get to do that yesterday. And it, it drains yeah. on you for a while you notice it. Yeah, it's a problem. So is is your second thing about that? Well, the running shoes, and then you said you had a, something else that you... Um, I would say like uh, uh, traveling has been a big one. Um, right. I never regret when I can, you know, I find a good deal on a, a, a ticket. You were telling me beforehand about your son who just t took off on a on a, 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 <laughs> a flight because yeah. he found a cheap ticket. And I'm, right. I'm the same way if I, you know, I like find something, uh, I'll take me and my wife somewhere. Um, and I find uh, it's really refreshing to go somewhere that you're unfamiliar with because you have to think about things in different ways, um, yeah. especially like in a, a culture or something. If you go somewhere into a different country where everything isn't as you always take it for granted. So you learn all these you, you're all of a sudden paying more attention because you're trying to learn. You're trying to adapt. You're trying to navigate. 
right. you're trying to figure out the best way to how do you eat your meal <laughs> and and you so you pick up all these things you wouldn't have picked up just by reading a book about the place or something uh, you mm -hmm. you you see how diff how people interact differently and so you yeah. you know it really opens your mind um and it gets you really thinking about all these different details which is great as a writer because then you can bring in all these little details uh, into your book and just give it this much more meatier feel to it. I yeah. think that's, you know, that's, that's something like when you're in the real world and trying to write about real world places, it, it helps. And then even writing like science fiction, you're writing a world that's completely made up. You draw on all these different traditions right. and cultures and histories to it's create huge, something. Yeah. It's a, and I think it's a huge mistake to rely on Google maps. Yeah. Which I, a lot of writers <laughs> do, I have found actually going to your research location is, is, yeah, you, it's it's like it's like finding jewels, things you never would have guessed. Yeah, so, or yeah, I think it's it's a remarkable um, opportunity to go to these places. Yeah, I wanna I wanna plug something. So I asked my son, where did you get this cheap flight all of a sudden suddenly? And he said, uh, Scott's cheap flights. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, scottscheapflights.org is, in fact, there's one going to Manila for $400. Apparently. Yeah, I, I also subscribe to their emails. So, and I'm not paid. I don't get any, I don't get any, you know, feedback from that or anything, but there's yeah. There's absolutely it's, nothing, but right. yeah. Yeah, same, same thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The one bad thing is like, uh, I'll get those emails, you know, several times a week with, here's a place where you can go for a cheap flight. It's like, ah, uh, you know, I want to go there too. Now I want to go there. And it's just like your to be read list. Like you have this bucket list of places that, <laughs> that yeah, you build up. Funny. So yeah, my son was in Copenhagen last week. And I said, you know, <laughs> texting before you leave the border would be great. Um, just so I know, that's all. <laughs> anyway, um, so traveling is fantastic for authors. Um, so what is, what is, you recently went to Japan on yeah. one of these trips. So, so what is something? And Japan does play a, a part in your in your book, small part, but a part in your your book, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, when you went there um, recently, has did anything come out at you? Like, uh, I saw you post pictures on uh, online. Sorry, and and I saw Totoro. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. my kids things, and you're like, too much Totoro. So, I mean, but book wise, was there anything that stood out that you thought? Yes. Yeah, so there, there's a couple things that that stood out to me, and I'm not sure like how I'll use these yet in in a in a book. But of course, like the landscape is great, the culture is rich, and I've been to Japan once before and really loved it. Got to go there for a, a, a different uh, business trip, so I've been fortunate that you know I get I get to go out there with work. Uh, but okay. so there's there's two things, and there's there's one. I mean, like besides being like nerd heaven and like yeah. <laughs> with all the Totoro and everything, yeah. that was great. Mm -hmm. But there's there's one story that I love to tell about my first trip there, mm -hmm. and it's the like Japan has a very unique culture, you know, all these layers of uh, politeness and stuff that I can't even begin to appreciate, you know, a, a, as a foreigner. It's really difficult to to fully appreciate that, even if you read about it or ask people about it. Um, but my favorite example is when I was walking down the street in Tokyo in Shinjuku, one of the busiest neighborhoods in. In, in Tokyo with all the flashing lights, everything you kind of imagine from stereotypical Tokyo. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden you hear a siren, there's a police car coming. And so of course cars are, are all stopped and waiting. Um, and the police car goes through the intersection, but as he's going through the intersection, he's bowing and like smiling at all the cars that stop for him. And it was just that little bitty detail, something like that, that is like so steeped in, you know, that, that culture that like we're not used to that at all. And so that thing just, it just had a, it kind of resonated with me as, as mm -hmm. there's the similarities of here's the cop car going, doing what it's going to do. But mm -hmm. there's that stark difference that reminds you, you know, this, you know, that our, our cultures might have all these similarities, but there's all these differences to appreciate. And then the second thing that really stood out from this last trip was going to Hiroshima. Oh, and, it was it's it was both emotional and sobering because of course there's all these memorials the peace memorials uh, mm -hmm. to to the day of the uh, that the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and you read these stories and you know of course that has an impact on you thinking you know what drives two countries to inflict this kind of damage on each other and so there's you you get this really big emotional appreciation for that but mm -hmm. then Hiroshima itself is still such a vibrant city there's so much going on 
it's a really friendly city. And so you see kind of what this regrowth has done over, you know, over these decades, half a, over half a century since. Um, but still, like you go to the art museums there and there's exhibits that are inspired by that bombing. So something that happened, you know, uh, 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 over half, it's almost a century, you know, growing on almost a century. Uh, there's, there's still this really strong resonating impact. And I think that's something that we can appreciate just as human beings, but also in our writing is, uh, there's, there's all these events that have happened before your characters show up in the book, before the events that happened that brought on the apocalypse and like the tide. And so if you can think about like how those resonating events impact the society or your character i think you can build this rich you know culture this rich story out of it so that's a really long-winded answer but those are my no, biggest I was, <laughs> I, was, I was struck by your opening paragraph your your opening chapter because i had read the holocaust of hiroshima hiroshima mm -hmm. um and immediately you went into you went into that i won't give it away why but um, that was really that was really interesting yeah. So, yeah, I found that intriguing because you've obviously done that research and weaved it into your story and that was it was pretty profound. But yeah, reading about that, I don't think most Americans just don't really realize what actually happened there on the ground. It was Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we never get that. I mean, it's it's interesting like we kind of gloss over events like that and I think we lose the appreciation for we have fun writing about the apocalypse, but it's not really that fun. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like you said before. That story, that particular story was written by one of the few survivors who witnessed it. Yeah. He just happened yeah. to have been uh, underneath a lorry, a lead lorry at the time. Yeah. And crazy. never never became ill. Um, but he lost his parents, his yeah. everyone it was terrible. Anyway, yeah. I want to point out um, several of our 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 fans here watching and Lori uh Flagenhauer. She says, hello. Um, she asks, what's what's the best advice for a new author? What's your best advice for a new author? Uh, I would say, I mean, the, the most basic advice is uh, from, from a craft perspective is hopefully, you know, like a, you're writing every single day. Um, yeah, and I think advice. that's that is the key. Make sure that it's a habit and it's you've got discipline. And I mean, that's really the best thing you can do because the to make to get traction as an author you either have a really big hit and you're one of those lucky people that become an instant bestseller you know within a few months of releasing your book but the far more likely thing is it's a churn it's a grind and yeah. it's like anything else you have to do a lot of work and uh, i think that so mm -hmm. so besides writing every day the best thing you can do is get a series ready a series that is you know unique you've got some unique twists but you know that there's people that are dying to read this book get a, get three of those books together at least you know have those planned out and mm -hmm. find out where your fans are and make sure that they see that you have three books that you wrote just for just for them and they didn't know it yet <laughs> excellent advice i think that's fantastic um tammy pile blackwell says hello gilles grusson is my friend <laughs> in, uh, he is a friend of mine in uh france and uh he says sorry can't stay it's 3 30 there but it's nice to see us <laughs> um, Ashlyn Waterstone says, howdy y'all. I love hearing about the different cultures. Yeah, that's really cool. I think we have a great job. In the fact that we get to, we get to visit other cultures and bring it back into our stories. You know, it, it is kind of a cool thing to do. It is. Yeah. Okay. So there were a couple of uh, other questions I have here. Let's see. Um, oh goodness, this one I thought was really pretty funny. Okay, sorry, hold on. This was, there was a really cool one that I was like, okay, we have to talk about that. Okay, it has something to do with your science community. So, All right. Uh, you said, it's a wild idea. If, not, if I recall correctly, the science, the scientific community is still divided on whether these things are actually alive. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not the right one. But it, it, <laughs> it goes back to you talking about your antibiotics and whether or not that one thing was correct. Oh, this was your example of, um, of really great, but it was just really great writing, but it you know, it is, it was sad at the same time. So this kind of throws you into the desperation of a father, just thinking about these things, but it puts the reader right there. And that's, that's what you really want. 
um, you said they crept through the yard and passed a swing set. And this is this is a group of military guys, you know, and they're geared up and they're dealing with zombies and stuff. An autumnal breeze swept through the jostling and jostled the swing chains. It gave rise to a light tinkling of metal against metal, coupled with the clear blue sky. Dom couldn't help the resurfacing of memories of pushing his daughters on a swing set like that in their backyard with Bethany. How do you do that? You're a scientist. You're not supposed to be able to write like this. This is fantastic. I mean, that is just amazing. But there was another, um, gosh, there was another quote and I don't think I wrote it down, but it was the one where um, you were talking about, okay, yeah, I didn't write it down, darn. But it was it was fantastic, and you were talking about how um, one of your one of your science geek guys was um, he was he was doing this thing where or she I think it was a she and she was saying so, she was giving some information very technical and he's like knock it off and you said it really well and darn I don't have it here but it was it was a great quote but basically you were you were saying you know stop stop inflating your head and you know, give it, give it to us straight, that kind of thing. But you point out the differences. It's like, I thought that was very clever of you because you did it for your readers. You could have said it that way, but, but you did it really well in order to convey that message without, and, and also showing a certain character's arrogance. I, yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, would, I, would, I would like to say. <laughs> yeah. But Ashley Waterstone said that that was an amazing part. So someone knows what I'm talking about. Thank yeah, you. I, I think it's Samantha. I think it's it was from Samantha. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure because based off the characterization, it's one of the uh, like the the computer people. Yeah, it was one of the computer computer yeah. people. Yeah, it was funny. I was like, dang, that was great. That was fantastic. <laughs> okay, so um, you're a busy guy. You have this huge day job. You also have this uh, wonderful writing career, and you're a runner, and you travel, and uh, so, so are you also a reader? And what are you reading right now? Okay. Yeah, I, I I love to read, and sometimes I don't read as much as I should be. I will say one thing that I've done uh, in between uh, the running and working out stuff is listen to audiobooks, and that's good for wow. when I'm driving. So I'm always I've always got one thing in the audiobooks and one thing in um, the uh, the the Kindle or my paper book. So. From the audiobook perspective, I'm doing uh, Children of Time by Adrian. Oh, man, is it? I want to say Tchaikovsky, but like, the, the, I don't know if that's right or not. Yeah. Because obviously, that's that's that's, that's a I, that's a very Children you know, of different. I'm sorry, uh, what was the title again? Children, Children of, of Children of Time. Children of Time. Okay. And it's it's like a it's like a science it's a science fiction thing. Uh, um, space exploration stuff, just this beautiful story of this growth of the new civilization uh, yeah. while humanity's looking for like a new spot to live and stuff. It's really cool parallel story. So I'm halfway through that and yeah. then doing uh, Marco Clu's uh, Terms of Enlistment, which is great for the gritty sci military sci-fi stuff. Cool. Okay, very cool. So, okay, anyone, uh, Ashlyn? Ask any questions. Now's your chance. I'm looking to see if there are any new comments. Okay, uh, let's see. And so, so after you're done, after you wrap up the Tide series, what are you working on next? Or do you are you like me, where you're like, go away, new idea. I've got to finish this right now. You know, is that? Do you have other ideas brewing back there? Sorry, um, it cut out a little bit. So, ah. um, d did you ask like uh, what's are you are you working on any other ideas after this series is done? After the Tide series is done, do you have other ideas back there that is brewing? Yes, yeah. So um, I've got a couple things going on. Uh, the first is going to be my own kind of. I have a somewhat secret military sci-fi project that I'm working on, uh -huh. um, as well as uh, Nick Sansbury Smith and I are going to be writing a spin-off post-apocalyptic series together, at least one book together that we're planning out actually this next weekend. So we got a couple couple in the fire. That is gonna be massive between the two of you guys. Yeah. Crazy good. It'll be fun. 
now I, I've read his work and yours now, and I can see where that's, that's gonna be amazing. Okay, cool. And so what, so was it Nick that got you to start writing? Have you always wanted to write? Um, I actually started, so I started writing uh, back in college. Besides doing the engineering degree, I did uh, a degree in English. And so, so that kept me grounded in the, kept me reading and writing. And so I started writing seriously once I graduated. Uh, and once I started, I, you know, I tried to do a few different stories and books that didn't always come together. So I've been, I, I've just been writing on my own. And then I finally reached out to Nick after, you know, listening to, you know, uh, some author podcasts and stuff. And I saw that he is from University of Iowa. So that's how I, um, I got really started writing the apocalyptic stuff was after I started talking to him about that kind of stuff and just making that random connection. Mm -hmm. That is, that's fantastic. Nick's a great guy. Um, Ashlyn Waterstone says, when is Tide 9 planning to come out? I think I saw an announcement recently. Yeah, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it will be out uh, winter 2019. So let's go January or February. <laughs> I'm yeah. trying not to be you know, I'm like, like I'm trying not to over promise, you know, I, I'd rather under promise and over deliver, but it's editing. written just editing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah doing that dance too. I'm like, eh, I can't really say yet. So um, are you a pantser or a plotter? I always have to ask that. Yeah, yeah definitely plotter. I, I started out really plotting books and that's the only way I feel I can like hit my daily word count. If I don't spend, you know, I spend like a week or two, uh, plotting these books and then I use uh, that way I can use my time a little bit better when I start writing them. I, I usually find that I twist Efficient. something or something happens that I wasn't exactly planning so it screws up everything oh. but at least I have a starting. What do you do whenever because I mean I've tried I have had you know good a good plot going you know I plot it all out but I'm a pantser total pantser <laughs> well you know what happens whenever you screw it up do you just have to go do you just throw it away and redo your do you somehow make it come back to your your plot what do you do yeah I mean usually usually like the main sticking points like the some of the like twists or the science stuff like I still come back to that it's okay. just a different path. You know, it's like, it's like we're climbing the mountain. I know I'm going to start at the bottom. I'm going to get to the peak, but then who knows which lookouts we're going to go to <laughs> in between. And so that's usually kind of what happens. <laughs> My cat always makes an appearance. This is Henry. <laughs> Gotta have some attention. Yeah. <laughs> Getting jealous. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to think we've discussed so many things. Gosh. How do you come up with the tie with the titles of your books? That seems so hard for me. So what is how do you do it? Oh, coming up with titles. Um, so uh, I would say for the tide, uh, I kind of cheated because I got into well, I'm gonna like where I use a nautical reference for every title. So that makes it really easy because then I look up a glossary of nautical terms <laughs> and I just pick, hey, this one sounds like this book and it goes with the theme of it. So we'll go with that. Way so too See, that, now, made it, that made it a little nicer. Oh, no. See, I have to struggle through at least 30,000 words before I can come oh, up yeah. with a title. And then I'm like, okay. You know, and then it's like a couple of days of like word matching, writing things down and checking yep. with my buddy Steve Conkley or, or one of my other friends. <laughs> I'm like, does this make sense? And he's like, nah. Like, yeah, that's my process. Yeah. Hit and miss. It's like you can write a book, you know, it's like a hundred thousand words. And then you have to write the description of that book, which is only 200 words and pick two words as a title. And suddenly yeah. that's the hardest that's part the of it. Hardest thing <laughs> to pick the title. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Josh Levine, he says, or Levin, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name. He says, as someone who is waiting for the eternal frontier Four audio book, do you have more planned for tag and crew? Yeah, I do have, I have the, fifth book in that series, which will wrap up the stories planned, just not written yet. So I have to fit that in with all these other projects. So once the tide's completed and we've got this thing with uh, Nick and I going on, hopefully I can squeeze that in there as well. <laughs> You're it's, a, it's a busy schedule. You can do it, I'm sure. So out of all of your books, all of your series, do you have a particular favorite? Um. 
I really liked uh, writing. I would say there's 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 probably my favorite Tide book is the uh, Iron Wind and and excuse me the the hunters and the whole crew finds themselves uh, after a series of events in the Congo, and it's kind of my uh, like uh, tribute to Joseph Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness, <laughs> and so. So that's wow. something it's like the apocalypse now heart of darkness version and, and the tide so i had you know tried to tried to uh give it give it a make a worthy tribute in the apocalypse to, to something like that so that was uh probably my favorite in the tide series so far wow that's that's a really great answer actually gosh okay anything else do you have any like comments or anything else that you'd like to to um you know, give us, is there any topics you'd like to discuss? Oh man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm open to anything. If people have, you know, questions or whatever about writing or not writing. Yeah. Where can, uh, let's see, where can people find your work? The easiest place is uh, almost all my stuff is Amazon exclusive. So uh, Amazon is the best place to go. And if you forget how to spell my name, which is a challenge, um, the best thing to do is there's a show called Hotel Impossible on the Travel Channel. And wow. the host of that show has the exact same name as me. Wow. So if you ever forget, that's the, that's the key to figuring it out. So he, him and I actually get, um, every once in a while, I'll get an email from somebody that asks me to either yeah. feature their hotel on his show or they want a job in the hotel industry and stuff. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, I, I can't really help you with that, unfortunately. <laughs> but I am an author, and here's my, you know, links to my books if you want to read those. That's yeah, pretty cool. yeah, yeah. And I mean, we both. I mean, obviously, our names are pretty uncommon. So the fact that you know we've got a writer, Anthony Melchior, and then this mm -hmm. uh, TV show host, Anthony Melchior, makes it a little difficult sometimes because he got the anthonymelchiori.com URL before I could. So I'm Anthony J melchiori.com which is why all my books have the j in there was because of hotel impossible so there's a fun fact too <laughs> um ashley waterstone she says i am in on how many how many um books you actually accomplished or how many how many do you write a year um i think i average about four a year okay yeah that's that's pretty significant with the with the the detail that you write with, I think that is really significant. So, I mean, as a, as a child, were you always going to be this uh, engineer, the scientist engineer, or, or, you know, did you, did you, what, what was your favorite children's book series? Ooh, ooh, that's yeah. easy for me. Animorphs oh. all the way. I loved the Animorphs. <laughs> oh. And I wanted to be growing up. I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I loved animals. So the fact that there was a, it goes with what you're doing today. Yeah. Yeah, so the fact that it was a science fiction book where people turned into animals when I was a kid, yeah. that, that, that hooked me to reading. And so I didn't stop, uh, you know, after that point. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to be a veterinarian up until, I would say, high school. And then for whatever reason, I was looking at stuff considered being a human doctor instead of an animal doctor. And then mm -hmm. after investigating that a little bit more, um, I realized my, my real interest was in the research side of things. I didn't quite like people enough to deal with them, you know, every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I don't want to touch people, you know. <laughs> yeah. So many. Sorry, <laughs> I, I could do this. I could do the lab thing, but I, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's enough people dealing with the, dealing right. with the lab stuff is just the right amount of people. I mean, people are surprised. You know, we work in teams. It's not like a solitary thing. So I'm I am working very closely with a lot of people every day. But it, you know, at least like we're a team together. We're not. We don't have to deal with. Uh, patients. <laughs> yeah. So we can still help people without of course, uh, having, yeah. Of course, on the other end, I'm extremely grateful for those people who can and do oh, that. Yeah. Doctor friends, I have a really fantastic uh, uh, doctor cousin, John. He's an emergency medicine doctor, and I ask him tons of questions all the time, and I'm so thankful for those. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. absolutely. Not my, yeah. Not, my, not my thing, but I'm, I'm thankful for them. We so work with some, uh, yeah, we work with some crazy people who decide they want to be in school for their whole lives, and uh, they'll do 
an M MD PhD. So they'll both get their clinical doctor uh, education and then also do the science PhD part of it with our lab. And those yeah. people, I mean, those people have a crazy drive and I admire, <laughs> I admire that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to say one other thing. I just, just drifted through my mind because um, it's late. I'm tired. But um, <laughs> uh, you really, you really do draw on strong female characters. I mean, you've written some very strong female characters in this. You don't shy away from that as a male writer. That was really impressive. Have you had like strong, strong women in your life to, to pull that from or um, yeah. your wife and your mom <laughs> and those people into your books? What, you know, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say I'm pretty, I'm pretty fortunate that I have had some very significant, uh, uh, um, my, my sister, mother, and then, you know, my, my wife, of course, uh, my wife's also a psychologist. So it's really great if I want to get really dig deep into <laughs> to how people work. But, but I mean, I honestly, like the, the biggest thing for me is, you know, growing up with a sister is great because you get to see, yeah, there are some differences between her and me, but also it's, you know, like, uh, I think George R. R. Martin said it best. And that, you know, somebody's like, how do you write such good, you know, uh, female characters? It's like, well, I find that women are people too. And <laughs> I think like, yeah. you know, that, like the, the wisdom there is like, you know, no matter what a person comes from, no matter, you know, their background, there are some things that make their experience different than yours. And so you have to appreciate that. But I think there's a lot of similarities as well, you know, in our daily lives. And so that, you know, I kind of try not to shy away from that challenge. And i probably get a lot of crap wrong, but I, you know, can learn from that, hopefully. Okay, I'm missing some comments here. And we have about about five minutes left. It says, what would you ever want to have your books purchased? Would you ever want to have your books purchased through your website? Ask Ashlyn Waterstone. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've considered that because I know some authors that, yeah, they'll sell their books through their website. But I'm already, you know, like, uh, dealing with the indie side of publishing, there's already so much business stuff. I, I think exactly. I'll shy away from that for now and, and you yeah. know, gladly give up the extra royalties so somebody else can take care of that and have a nice storefront for, yeah. <laughs> for it, the readers. It is enough trying to run your own business and be a writer at the same time. It is, it is so time consuming. Yeah. And yeah. you're doing great. So Josh Levin, he says, so about doctoral work, do you have any advice for someone starting on his on this journey? Oh, yeah. If I remember right, I believe Josh said he just got accepted into a PhD program somewhere. So congrats to Josh. Um, yes. But yeah, I would say the biggest thing you can do is hopefully have a good relationship with your advisor uh, and mesh well with the person who you're doing your doctoral work with. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that uh, they've blazed that path for you. And, you know, they've, they've, they've followed, you know, I guess the old adage, you know, they've stood on the shoulders of giants and, and you're going to do the same thing. So it's always nice to make sure you have a good relationship with them because there are hard days and easy days doing research, whether you're doing anything from English to bioengineering. And so having your advisor be your champion, your mentor and all that, you know, in one, one uh, role can be difficult, but very, very productive if you maintain a good relationship with them. Wow. Excellent advice. Okay. I think we're going to wrap it up, but I wanted to say thank you so much and please purchase his books on Amazon. And uh, next week, uh, the Apocalypse Queen Radio will be interviewing James Wesley Rawls. And then the week after, um, and you can find his books on Amazon as well. And the week after that, uh, this is a new bestseller, The Rule of One. Let me try to get it in the screen by these sisters and it's it's a dystopian and it's a young adult and it's excellent so join us you know the next two weeks for those and and um when when you have anthony whenever you have a new release come back again whenever you and nick sansbury smith come back with uh, that dual book yeah definitely contact me so yeah we'll that'd be great i'm sure yeah. we'd love to be on together we've done that a couple times <laughs> with stuff so that'd be a lot of fun yeah, that would be great. I've had him on and he's he's fantastic. You're both wonderful writers. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, okay. thank you for having me. It's, it was a lot of fun. Oh, good. Okay, thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>